Thank you for including me, Ned. This is the 18th conference of the Center on Capitalism and Society that I've attended. I missed the first two. And I'd like to uh, yeah, um, review what I've learned, uh, how the Center and its project has shaped my view of capitalism and society, of work, business, finance, the good life, to take stock here. And well, this is going to be my own journey, I, I think it parallels those of us who are part of Ned's band. So to begin at the beginning, this is my original idea of what the good life was. Um, we know what our preferences are. We can rank them. We can abstract. Um, various options and uh, perform this calculation so that work um, is a sacrifice of leisure and the less we do of it, the more leisure we have to put into household production. We purchase goods with the money that we make and out comes the present value of utility. And I mean, I still haven't completely abandoned this idea, but certainly uh, we, we've gone way beyond. And to the extent, if I had a view of what caused production, it was, uh, you know, put in some capital and some labor, and um, education can add to human capital, so basically augments labor. And then there was some technological progress, which kind of went at a constant rate. Maybe you could invest more in our R&D, and then G would, G would go up, and probably would have thought that production function is Cobb-Douglas, even though there's no evidence for it. Um, so at our conference in Venice uh, in 2006, it was supposed to be about the sluggish productivity growth in, in Europe. That was the, uh, the theme of the conference. But already, Ned was advancing his um, thesis that values learned at your mother's knee um, could be somehow at work. And, and values of solidarity, family, security, social cohesion, anti-commercialism showed up as being a drag on labor force participation and statistically significant, perhaps a little bit less so, on uh, productivity. And he had not yet developed his um, concept of modern values, the, the word modern values, to contrast with conditional values, traditional values, but already openness to the new um, exercise of imagination, adventure, overcoming individualism, personal growth. Um, oh, yes, an early concern, though, at that time was what's eating Europe. But it, it actually, this was a while ago. It wasn't yet clear whether the period of slowdown from 1970 to 1995 was the aberration, and now we have the internet, we're gonna go back on, on track again, or whether it was that period from late 1990s to early 2000 that was the outlier. And you know, I think that question has been resolved unhappily that we have uh, entered into a period of secular Malays, and gradually our attention at the center has turned in that direction. Okay, I um, found in the bottom of a drawer, oops, this photo from the Venice Conference. And um, it's, um, you can see two of the people here have went on to become heads of state, Lucas Papademos and Mario Draghi. We see uh, our dear friend Jean-Paul Fitoussi poking out in the back, Penti um, I guess one of the remarkable things, if 17 years have passed, um, but uh, Luigi Paginetti hasn't changed at all. And, uh, I, 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 I don't know why. Oops. OK. We've, we've covered a lot of ground in 20 years, and in trying to process our various conferences, um, I've identified two main themes. First is understanding capitalism from, from first principle. What defines modern capitalism? Uh, how's it doing in terms of 
productivity, worker satisfaction. Uh, what defines the good economy? And how does the good economy relate to the good life? Um, and what are the policy measures, if any, that we can enact to restore capitalism to its former glory? The second key theme that runs throughout our 20 years has been foundations of, um, of capitalism, trying to come up with methodologies and, um, and theories that will take us beyond the neoclassical paradigm to um, capture the essentially dynamic qualities of human experience. How do we account for adventure, flourishing, self-knowledge? Um, so you know, I would paraphrase Veblen, who said in 1909 that, you know, uh, despite all their use of, of, of dynamic, uh, Mr. John Bates Clark nor many of his associates in this line of research have yet contributed anything at all to appreciable to a theory of genesis, growth, sequence, change, process, or the like in economic life. So I would sort of paraphrase that with, with all of the agents that we have that populate economic models, none of them really have a sense of agency or ability to exercise will. Um, so here's um, where I think we come out on the first question, what is, what defines capitalism and what can we do about it? And the um, guiding text for this conclusion is mass flourishing. So our center was here as all of this was being developed and then afterwards to digest it and the work that came afterwards. So as Ned says, a good economy promotes lives of vitality and its natural home lies within a dynamic capitalist economy. Um, the, um, you know, it um, ought to enable entrepreneurs who are caught up in the sport of economic life, um, allow people to, uh, you know, to supply agile thinking, to take risks, spark innovation um, that will in turn make work rewarding jobs that are accessible to everyone. Not only those with the skill set to become ro robotics engineers in Silicon Valley, but those whose work depends on muscle, sociability, organizational skills, practical cleverness. And those workers in a good capitalist economy will not be alienated from their labor since their labor is a continuous expression of creativity. You know, modern capitalism ought to do two things. First, it should um, lead to innovation and output and material well-being, but also chance for people to flourish in this context. You know, those two things are not necessarily connected. You could imagine one and not the other. It's an empirical question. You say uh, sloth and overeating are naturally appealing, but there's evidence that they're not good for our health. Uh, democracy, people more or less want to live in a democracy, and there's evidence that it leads to stability and, um, and, and prosperity. The same thing with free markets. People like freedom in, in uh, their economic lives. And within limits, uh, it has led to a greater output. So is um, dynamic modern capitalism, is it like sloth and overeating, um, good and bad for us, or the other way around? Or is it like democracy and free markets, where it is uh, good in its own right and good for us in terms of total factor productivity? And the evidence. We see it first in mass flourishing, later in uh, dynamism with, uh, that Ned wrote with Gilfie and Hyun Tech. We find that um, the satisfaction infused by modern values both leads to um, um, worker flourishing and to total factor productivity. It is both, it is both things. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important regularity. You know, we've probably been more successful in diagnosing the situation and figuring out a series of interventions to fix it, although we have a lot to say on it. One thing that we have never really gone in for in the 20 years are financial schemery to try to 
induced innovation. Um, dabbled with it a few times, but you know, uh, there was a paper that was uh, published in our in our journal, Capitalism and Society, that showed that you know well, there's more venture capital in the United States, but Europe has the tax and regulatory uh, infrastructure to allow for venture capital. The impact of venture capital on productivity is way overstated. Um, it's not as adventurous as it makes itself out to be. And that if there were projects in Europe that um, venture capitalists in the US wanted to finance, they would be uh, able to do so and, and certainly do. To make this point somewhat more precise, there's a, a paper in our journal that um, is, to me, is one of the most uh, influential papers that I have read. It was by um, Zach Hauser uh, called uh, Investing in the Unknown and Unknowable. And uh, he tells the story of David Ricardo, who on a hunch bought British government bonds before the uh, Battle of Waterloo. And, uh, he expected that the, um, that the Duke of Wellington and his Prussian allies would win. Now, what's the probability that's going to happen? I mean, uh, something like that had never happened before. It's never going to happen again. It's a river that the world is going to step in once. Um, but he took the leap. He got Malthus to join in with him, but Malthus chickened out before the end and made a small profit. And Ricardo uh, made a huge profit. So he engaged with the unknown and the unknowable. The language of risk and expected return doesn't apply here. The conditions were deeply ambiguous. They would never come again. The paper opened my eyes. If you could abstract from an investment's essential feature and boiled the decision down to a set of rules, someone would have arbitraged it away by now. Uh, it's judgment all the way down. So when it comes to coping with ambiguity, a, a public vehicle uh, that would uh, try to uh, uh, enable innovation would be uniquely poorly placed to deploy that money wisely. Uh, we have come up with some ideas if I go through the uh, history of the center's presentation. Um, hmm. uh, Lizzie, I seem to be stuck here. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm stuck. So as already mentioned, low-wage subsidies, an idea that Ned promoted in rewarding work. Uh, we have a, 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 a theme that uh, together with uh, common good in, uh, in, in unmasking the red tape and bureaucracy that limits agency in, within government early childhood education, and I think, you know, I still think the most important contribution that we make in the end is the idea that through work, through capitalism, through enterprise, that people can ex exercise their creativity and that we don't have to indulge in the, um, you know, when, when workers feel that the rich men in Richmond are oppressing them because, because of their job, that, that it's something that, that uh, isn't inevitable and it's not inherent and it wasn't uh, always that way. Um, in terms of the, um, the methodological foundations, I'll um, go to my, my, my own work. It started at the, at the um, which I called a prequel to mass flourishing. It started in a paper at the center called Nietzsche and the Economics of Becoming in 2009 and then uh, later on into my, my book, Willful. And I, I argued there that, that life is twofold. Sometimes we can rank our choices, we can compare them and uh, act with the purpose, try to do what will best satisfy our preferences, which we understand. Um, sometimes we might fall prey to um, cognitive biases and, and, and one of the catalog of 160 of them, but um, I feel that mostly, um, you know, we, we, we know what we want and can, can choose rationally. But uh, there are moments where we can't trade this for that at, at, at some price. Uh, actions great, great and small uh, that are undertaken for their own sake, that are neither rational 
nor irrational, but for itself. It can be a flow, a process, a self-justifying game, a struggle to overcome a challenge that may not be important in any objective way. Uh, the for itself behavior um, in one of these limbs here um, can be acting on our beliefs that constitute our identities that are not always up for sale at, at some price. Um, and the rational model, I argue, cannot explain, nor can it be adjusted to explain how we decide to consume now or later, to retire, continue working, procrastinate, engage in random altruistic acts, um, can be inattentive to personal finances, start quixotic businesses, persevere with projects for long after they should have been abandoned. Um, and in contrast, the more fluid for itself model can capture individual behavior as it unfolds in time in response to challenges that we encounter. You know, I'd, I'd like to um, just take a moment to highlight some uh, presentations at center conferences that have been particularly impactful for me. And, um, you know, in the discussion of inequality, um, I take a step back. We all share an intuition that everyone should have enough. We object to people who are poor, who subsist in uh, material conditions that prevent them from having a good life. This doesn't necessarily translate into inequality of consumption or maybe worse wealth or worse income. Um, you know, income is relatively easy to measure but notoriously tricky. We've published some uh, papers in our journal, Capitalism Society, by Jerry Out Outen, Tom Coleman, and Shi Song that I can recommend. The results might, might surprise you. But uh, putting all that aside, what does it mean to have enough? Well, turns out it's 50 different things. And when Martin Burt presented the poverty stoplight in 2017, I thought, well, maybe it is possible if you t undertake this massive project to think about what it means. And I didn't realize that he would be here with us today. So, uh, and he's, he's actually given me an update on, oops, on what the Poverty Stop Project has done. They've gone to 54 countries, surveyed 300,000 families, 1.75 million people, to ask them uh, whether what in their circumstances is important to them and feels that uh, would allow them to live a good life. And so things like, you know, do you have potable water or do you have to tra travel to unfamiliar places to get the water that you want? And I think what, what progress we could make in the debate on, at least on poverty and inequality, if we brought the poverty stoplight into the center of this argument. Um, the second best moment at our conference, as far as I'm concerned, is in our uh, 2013 conference uh, when um, David Sidorsky spoke on the age of the individual 500 years ago today. And um, to simplify, he said that no short list of values can provide a blueprint for a society and that since decision makers often have to trade off values uh, under the constraints that prevail at the time uh, and change disrupts tacit values so needs to be undertaken gradually. So I adopted a new political philosophy as a result of this, uh, anchored in, in pluralism. Um, you know, and I guess the, the talk itself is perfectly formed paragraphs rang out in Casa Italia. And, um, as his, his daughters led him from the podium at the end of, a, 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 end of his remarks, people could see that, that David couldn't see and the whole thing came from inside his head. It was an, you remember Richard, it was an amazing uh, moment. And I'm happy to see that Lowry and the next generation is taking David's work seriously. Um, oh, uh, the best moment has to have been at the uh, women's conference in 2019 where at the end of her talk, Joyce DiDonato sang Climb Every Mountain. Um, you know, um, if David is correct, was correct, about his remark that the um, 
cleverness of the devil includes his ability to recognize that moral values and idealistic, idealistic aspirations of human beings have the capacity and inclination to generate the fusion of these values and aspirations into a single monistic vision and blueprint, then I think it would follow that one of the devil's most effective tools in his project of moral corruption would be erasing words from the dictionary. And uh, there's no paper in our journal over all these years that I'm prouder to have edited than the final paper of Jean-Paul Fitoussi on newspeak and economic theory, how we were being talked to. Um, he um, describes how impoverishment of language impoverishes thought and in turn democratic debate. So he describes how a new vocabulary has canceled Keynesianism, only neoclassical theory remains in its place. And although behavioral economics and positive psychology is seem, seem to prevent an alternative way of thinking, they really only tighten its grip. Um, we're just robot, robots who are badly programmed, but we're still just as robotic. And uh, Jean-Paul's article leaves us with the genesis of an important project that combines psychology, linguistics, history, and economics. You know, I have uh, remarked in my, devoted my presentation last year to showing the overlap between the Phelpsian critique and Marx um, in terms of what uh, work means for the good life. Um, that, um, that uh, as Marx pointed out, that the overcoming of obstacles is itself a liberating activity, self-realization, and um, real freedom whose action is precisely labor. And in its historic forms, worker suffers four, four types of alienation, including estrangement of man from man in the production line and in work that is not rewarding. And I think that Ned and Marx went in different directions about what the remedy would be. I'm with Ned. Um, the um, workers owning the means to production hasn't solved this, and communism has, has failed miserably where it's been tried. Um, and that a good and just economy that can create non-alienating labor is, um, lies in a dynamic in capitalist economy. You know, Aristotle has come up several times today, and um, the, um, I, I, I will, he is perhaps the philosopher of the Center on Capitalism Society, and, um, you know, you'd say that human goodness derives from our function, and if we could figure out what our function is, then we could, we could know what was good. And to understand our function, we have to think about what is unique about humans among the animals. And it's, it's not rational thought. I mean, animals, this is Schopenhauer, my favorite example is Schopenhauer, who, who talks in the world as well an idea about elephants that had traveled throughout Europe and crossed many bridges. And then an elephant comes to a bridge and decides that it won't bear its weight. I mean, when the stakes are high enough, animals are, are pretty smart. Um, when I was a kid, I remember being taught that humans were the tool-making animals, and that was what was unique. But now there's all kinds of evidence that birds and apes and various animals can make tools. So th th that's not what it is. It's not language. What's unique about humans is collective intentionality. There is no other species that, as Michael Tomasello says, human reasoning, even when it's done internally, is shot through with this kind of collected normativity in which the individual regulates her actions and thinking based on the group's normative conventions and standards. I mean, there are animals that collaborate, um, 
but they do it according to instincts. Again, quoting Marx, what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of the bees is the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax. And writing about the same time, Abraham Lincoln noticed that you know, beavers build houses, but they build them in no wise differently than or better than they did 5,000 years ago, I guess presumably at the beginning of the world. Um, but they don't get together to figure out how to innovate and build a better dam. So that's where I would come out, I think, at the end of the, our, our journey here, that the good life and a good economy lies in a dynamic capitalist economy informed by modern values and the methods for understanding it, explaining it, describing it, lie outside of neoclassical economics. And I'll stop there. <laughs>